Is it best to use the perpetual or the dated futures to delta hedge our option portfolio? How can we switch efficiently between the two? How will our short vol portfolio cope with some larger moves in the Bitcoin price? And what on earth is the portfolio margin matrix? Whoa. These are the questions we'll be answering in today's video. This is the third in this series where we are currently delta hedging a small portfolio of options on Deribit. Today we will make several trades on both the options and futures. We will also discuss some more specifics about the delta hedging on the futures, including using the futures spreads to roll positions between different instruments. We will then close down the remaining positions before the holiday period, giving us the perfect opportunity to look at how the account equity has progressed so far in the series. At the end of the previous video, we left the account with short strangles in three different expiries, and their deltas were continuing to be dynamically hedged by the Greek's Life tool, using the perpetual. We are picking things up here just after the 1st of December expiry. As we can see on the price chart, the Bitcoin price was between the strikes of our 1st of December short strangle when the options expired, and remains within the range of strikes we have sold further out as well. The price isn't moving around too much, so there hasn't been much delta hedging needed, resulting in an additional profit being made since the last video, with the equity up from 0.2558 to 0.2568. In the transaction log, we can see the delivery entries for the 1st of December options that just expired. Of course, as they were both out of the money at expiry, there was nothing to pay for either of them. Devol, and implied volatility in general, is continuing to grind lower, which, combined with the underlying price remaining closer to the middle of the range of the strikes we have sold, is resulting in all of our short options being in profit. At this point, everything is going about as well as we could hope for. I was expecting this to continue with a relatively dull end to the year, with people taking a break for the holidays and waiting for the January ETF decisions. However, this calm does not last long. By the 4th of December, some of our call strikes are already being breached. The Bitcoin price is at $41,700, and we are short the 41k strikes on two expiries, and short the 42k strike on one expiry as well. Notice though that despite the somewhat large total move, the price action has been quite stable. Price has moved up or sideways consistently without any major pullbacks. This is important because we are short volatility, not price. So if the price grinds up in a gentle enough manner, our delta hedge leg will actually make us money instead of costing us something. We can see in the delta hedging tool that there have been several delta hedging trades, but they are all in the same direction, all buys, with the current price above each of those buys. So we would expect the delta hedge position on the perpetual to be showing a profit at the moment. In the account, we can see that overall a small additional profit has been made since the last check, before the increase in the price of Bitcoin. Several of the option positions are now making a loss. However, this has been completely offset by the delta hedge leg on the perpetual. Despite some of our short strikes being breached then, the short vol portfolio overall is still showing a nice profit. Eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that the two short puts on the 8th of December that we previously held have disappeared. These had already lost almost all of their value, so I closed these early for a few basis points with resting limit orders. Just two days later, and the rally has continued, with volatility also expanding a little, and price action getting a little more choppy, but not too bad yet. The delta hedging has had to do one sell, but it still mostly buys. The equity of the account is down a little since the last update, but the damage has remained limited partially thanks to the lack of any large pullbacks, so far. There has been a manual adjustment to the delta hedge though. So far in this series, we have only used the perpetual contract for our delta hedge, and the delta hedging tool is still set to only use the perpetual to make adjustments. And there is good reason to use the perp. It has the best liquidity, and most closely tracks the index price of Bitcoin. However, the account now has a position in the 8th of December futures contract as well. Our delta hedge is currently split between this dated futures contract and the perp. There are pros and cons to using each, and they may be more or less attractive at different times, so it's wise to be familiar with using both, including how to efficiently roll positions between the two. We will go through an example of how to execute these rolls using a futures spread shortly. But by looking in the trade history, we can see the pair of trades that have already been used to move $10,000 of the perpetual position to the 8th of December future. There is a trade that sold 10,000 of the perp, and a trade that bought 10,000 of the 8th of December future. 
and this combination effectively moved $10,000 of the Delta Hedge long from the perpetual to the dated future. These two orders were actually a single future spread order. The icon on the left signifies a combo trade, which just means multiple legs executed at once via some type of combo order, in this case a future spread, and we can see that both executions happened at the exact same time. One reason we may prefer to use a dated future is that the funding rate on the perpetual is becoming too high. We can see on the funding chart for the perpetual that as the Bitcoin price has increased, the funding rate is on average becoming higher. As we are long the perpetual, this means we are paying small amounts throughout the day. It's not a huge amount each day, but it can add up to a lot depending on how long we are holding the long position on the perp. Dated futures don't have a funding mechanism, so as long as the premium of the futures contract isn't too great, we may prefer to hold our delta hedge there instead. If we are mostly shorting options and then delta hedging them, when the underlying price increases, our delta hedge will usually be a long position on either the perpetual or a dated future. As the underlying price is increasing, funding is likely to be positive, and the dated futures are likely to be trading at a premium to the spot price and the perpetual. This means when we buy some deltas, we are either going to be paying funding on the perpetual or buying the future at a higher price, both of which will result in an eventual cost to us, and it's not always clear which one will be best over a certain time period. If you're now wondering if it's possible to make a profit by being on the other side of those futures trades, the answer is yes. Cash and carry trades take advantage of either the funding rates on the perpetual or the premiums on the futures by taking the other side of the trade, going short in this case. There is a series of videos on cash and carry trades that I created for the Deribit YouTube channel, which I will link to in the video description. You may want to save that for later. As well as the funding rate versus futures premium decision, another difference worth mentioning is that a position on a dated future will of course expire on the expiry date. If this matches the expiry date of all or some of the options, this can avoid unnecessary positions that need cleaning up after expiry. If the entire delta hedge is on the perpetual, the hedge will often need to be adjusted just after each option expiry. When using an automatic hedger, like the Greeks Live tool, this will be handled automatically, but it may not be as efficient as a future that will simply expire with the options. Back to our current hedge. As we have covered, the perpetual has a funding rate. However, the dated futures do not. In order to minimize the funding paid, we've moved $10,000 from the perpetual to the 8th of December future. So let's look at exactly how this can be done. What we want to do is trade two futures simultaneously with a single order. And this is exactly what a future spread allows us to do. In the top menu, we can find the future spreads, which takes us to a grid filled with each of the possible future spreads. The existing contracts are displayed along the top and down the side and where they meet in the grid is where the spread between those two contracts can be found. We want to trade the perpetual and the 8th of December future, so we just need to find where those two intersect. In this case, it is the top left cell in the grid. Some basic information is displayed for each of the possible spreads, but if we click the one we want, we will see the order form and the order book for this spread. The price of the spread is quoted as the first leg in the instrument name minus the second leg so the 8th of December minus the perpetual in this instance. As the 8th of December is currently trading slightly lower than the perpetual, the current price of this spread is actually negative. In order to move a long position from the perpetual to the 8th of December, we want to sell the perpetual and buy the 8th of December. We can see this combination listed under the buy button. Even if you're experienced trading future spreads or option combos, to avoid any silly mistakes, it's always worth checking the directions of the individual legs that will be traded under the buy and sell buttons. We don't have this much left on the perpetual at the moment, but for a moment, let's say we wanted to move another 10,000 from the perpetual to the dated future. To do this, we need to buy this spread, so we enter an amount of 10,000 and our desired limit price, then click the buy button. This will bring up an order confirmation screen that allows us to confirm the details, including double checking the directions, and we would then click the button to place the order. As another example, let's imagine we want to roll our remaining perpetual position of $2,730 to the next weekly expiry, the 15th of December. To do this, we find where the perpetual meets the 15th of December in the grid, and then click to open the order form. We then enter an amount of $2,730 and our desired limit price. For example, 
we may want to roll the position over to the future at the same price as the perpetual, in which case we would enter a price for the spread of zero. We then click buy, as this is the desired direction for each leg, confirm the details, and we would then send the order. We will actually place one of these future spread orders shortly. Before we skip ahead in time again, it's worth quickly mentioning that another way we could roll hedge positions from one contract to another is to select a different instrument for longs and shorts in the Greeks Live Delta Hedging tool. If we want to roll from the perpetual to the 15th of December, for example, we could choose whatever is currently the closing direction, that is the direction which would reduce our position size, as the perpetual, and then whatever is currently the opening direction, the direction which would increase our position size, as the 15th of December future. Our delta hedge is currently long, so our closing direction would be short, and our opening direction would be long. We have several calls that are now relatively deep in the money. As in previous videos, some 1% IV orders are placed to buy them back cheaply, just in case someone is looking to offload them. The next day the first sizeable pullback occurs, with the price dropping several percent from the previous day's high. This has resulted in some sells being executed for the delta hedge, but the options lost enough value at the same time for the account equity to remain roughly the same. The IV orders that we left to buy back the calls yesterday have been filled, so we have bought back the 41k and 42k 8th of December calls. Once the calls were closed, the delta hedger did its job and hedged the resulting portfolio delta back to zero. As we had moved part of the hedge over to the 8th of December future, and the delta hedger is set to only use the perpetual, this has resulted in us actually having a short on the perpetual and a larger long on the dated future. Let's place an order to net off the excess position here, by buying back the short on the perpetual and closing the same amount of the long on the 8th of December future. To achieve this, we will use a future spread again. After opening the order form for the correct spread, we enter the amount of 4640 and a limit price of $2. Although there is a discount on the fees when using future spreads, compared to using two taker orders in the individual books, the difference in fees between maker and taker is still enough to make it worth trying to get filled as a maker. The order is now placed, so we will leave it to see if it gets filled. It doesn't matter too much if it fills or not in this case, as the 8th of December future will be expiring tomorrow anyway. Once that future expires, the delta hedger will step in and use the perpetual to hedge any remaining deltas that breach the thresholds we have set. Our margin usage is a little low, and we are still interested in being active. So a short strangle is added on the next expiry, the 22nd of December. Limit prices are used, with one order filling immediately, and one after a couple of minutes. After the 8th of December expiry, we are once again left with a delta hedge on the perpetual, and short strangles in the 15th and 22nd expiries. So far, the Bitcoin price has increased quite a bit, and then decreased a little from the highs. The price action has been relatively gentle though, so despite the underlying price moving past our short strikes more than once, our short volatility portfolio has performed well, with the account equity currently sitting at 0.2572. The relative ease with which we have collected Theta so far is about to come to an end though. We rejoin the action here three days later on the 11th of December. Price fell around 10% before retracing about half of that. This is exactly the type of price action that will cause us losses, for our existing positions at least. The price has moved far and fast. Also crucially for us, it has moved quite far in both directions. This means we will have hedged our delta in both directions, most likely including at the extremes of the price action, resulting in considerable hedging losses. Additionally, the size and speed of the move is likely to have increased the implied volatility of the options we are still holding. Although on the flip side of this, if IV has increased, as long as we are not already fully allocated, we can now sell more options at hopefully higher levels of implied volatility. Let's head over to the account to check out the damage. The equity has decreased to 0.2542, so as expected, the recent volatility has caused some losses. The same option positions are being held but as can be seen in the trade history, there have been several trades in both directions on the perpetual. We are short vol, and vol increased, so it's not too surprising to see some losses. For the time being, we still want to be short vol though, and our margin usage is still a little on the low side, so we can add some more positions. To continue to express the short vol view into the end of the year, IV orders are used to add another short strangle to the 22nd of December expiry, 
as well as a short strangle on the 29th of December expiry. You may have also noticed a long $56,000 call option in the 15th of December expiry. This was added to the account for free as part of a trading competition happening on Deribit at the time. This position didn't cost us anything, and eventually it expires worthless. So other than a temporary effect on margin requirements, and being a nice free hedge against a large increase in price, it doesn't end up having any effect on the account. A few hours later, we've also added a long put position on the 15th of December expiry. We were short the 33, 33.5 and 34k strike puts with a size of 0.1 each. The price of all of these options has decreased to just a few basis points, so I wanted to close off the risk here. Instead of trying to get filled on three separate orders though, which would have been for similar prices anyway, I decided to simply leave an order for the total quantity, 0.3, to buy the highest of the put strikes, 34k. When this order was filled, it closed our short position on the 34k strike, and also turned our remaining shorts on the 33 and 33.5k strikes into bearish put spreads. This leaves no further downside risk on this expiry, and if price happens to decrease a lot, this spread could pick up some value for us to collect. Although the portfolio we have been managing in this series has been relatively simple, selling strangles and then delta hedging them, now would be a good time to take a look at the portfolio margin risk matrix. We can navigate to the portfolio margin page by clicking the PM button at the top of the screen, or by going to the top right menu and then clicking portfolio margin. For any option portfolios where some of the positions are at least partially hedging each other, portfolio margin will be the most capital efficient margin system to use. With portfolio margin, the whole portfolio is looked at together to determine the margin requirements. Whereas with a standard margin account, each position is margined individually, which for an option portfolio will normally result in much higher margin requirements. If you're not familiar with it yet, this page may be intimidating, but it's much simpler than it looks. In the risk matrix at the bottom of the page, we can see all our positions listed, similar to how they are in the positions table we've been looking at throughout the series. Instead of statistics about each position though, this table contains a calculation for our margin requirements for various different scenarios. Each column represents a different scenario that the portfolio is tested against. Each scenario involves a change in the underlying price and a certain level of implied volatility. For example, in the far left column, the scenario is a decrease of 20% in the underlying price and a decrease in implied volatility. The profit or loss effect this scenario would have on each position is given in this column, with the total also displayed. The next column tests each position against the scenario of a decrease in 20% in the underlying price and implied volatility remaining unchanged. And then the next column tests each position against the scenario of a 20% decrease in the underlying price and implied volatility increasing. These three volatility scenarios, down, unchanged and up, are repeated for each step change in the underlying price. In this table we have 4% steps in the underlying price going from minus 20% to plus 20%. Whichever scenario results in the largest loss, this is what is used in the margin requirements formula. In this example, we can see that the worst scenario for our current portfolio is the underlying price falling by 20% and implied volatility increasing. So it is this value that is used as the maintenance margin requirements. A couple of other small contingencies are added as well, but at least one of these contingencies is being removed from the calculation soon, so I won't go into detail on those in this video. Eventually then, this whole intimidating table boils down to just a single figure which is used to calculate our margin requirements. The other values in the table can still be useful to us though, as we can see which positions and which scenarios are causing the highest margin requirements. This can allow us to see where we have room to add risk, and also help us to make adjustments that will lower our margin requirements. For example, the worst scenario for us currently is underlying price down and vol up. This tells us that we could easily lower our margin requirements by buying some puts, which benefit from both the underlying price decreasing and IV increasing. We are currently dynamically hedging our deltas, and our margin usage is well within acceptable limits, so we are not too worried about reducing our margin requirements. If we did need to reduce our margin usage though, either buying back some of our short puts or turning some of them into spreads by purchasing some different puts would have the most beneficial impact on our margin requirements. Not wishing to be at the computer screen too much over the holidays, 
and with the ETF decision expected in early January, I decide to start winding down the positions from this point onwards. So the next few quick updates are just the existing positions either expiring or being closed. And then that leaves us with the perfect checkpoint to analyse what we've done so far in this series, what effect the hedging has had, and to look forward to some new strategies and hedging techniques in future videos. About three days after the big drop, we can see that the price has chopped around quite a bit before a decent rally today. This has of course resulted in quite a few delta hedging trades in both directions. This price action is far from ideal, but the account equity has remained relatively steady and currently sits at 0.2552. Other than the several delta hedging trades, we did manage to close the 41k call in the 15th of December expiry with an IV order we left at 1%. There are several positions due to expire tomorrow, so we will check back in after expiry. The price is in roughly the same place after expiry. And looking at the transaction log, we can see that the 44k strike call was closed a few hours before expiry with an IV order for a single basis point. The rest of the 15th of December position simply expired. We're now left with a couple of short strangles on the 22nd of December expiry, and another on the 29th of December expiry, and our equity is creeping back up with the price action calming a little. A few days later though, the price has made a sizeable move in each direction, which has caused some delta hedging losses again, with our equity back down to 0.2542. The puts on the 22nd of December expiry got down to a few basis points, so as we're in a risk reducing mode, those were closed. This leaves just the short calls on that expiry, and a short strangle on the 29th. If we wanted to add more positions, we would now be looking into the January expiries of course, but with the ETF decisions imminent, I don't think those expiries are currently offering a high enough level of IV to sell. Even the January 12th expiry, which should be decision week, is only offering around 55% at the money. So I would rather close down completely for the holiday period, and likely stay out until after the ETF decisions have been announced around the 10th of January. The 22nd of December expiry goes by relatively smoothly, with the delta hedging losses almost exactly cancelling out the loss of value of the options. As it's now the 22nd of December, I decide to close the remaining positions with limit orders. I tried to get filled in the middle on one of them, but after 15 minutes or so it hasn't filled so I just cross the spread and buy into the ask. After all of the option positions are closed, we are left with just the position in the perpetual. The Greeks Live Delta Hedger steps in shortly afterwards and closes this position. We will continue in the new year, but as we have closed everything for now, this would be a good time to zoom out a bit and look at what has happened so far. We started on November 6th with an equity of 0.25 Bitcoin and Bitcoin trading at around $35,000. We then continuously sold vol by selling strangles, usually around 20 delta strangles, on the weekly options up to three weeks out. It's now the 22nd of December, about six weeks after we started, and the Bitcoin price has increased in total by about 25%, with a few big swings in between. The account equity is sitting just under 0.2541, for a gain of about 1.6% of the starting capital. Knowing that we were going to be short volatility the whole time, this is not exactly the type of price action we would have hoped for when we started, so finishing this period with a profit is not a bad result in the end. I used some Python code and a download of the transaction log to show how the equity of the account evolved over time. The blue line shows what has actually happened in the account. I also calculated what the profit or loss would have been if we hadn't done any delta hedging. This calculation is shown by the red line. All delta hedging trades on the perpetual have been completely removed from the data for the red line. The profit and loss for each option position is included only when the option is closed, which makes this line more jumpy than it would otherwise be. However, the hedged line in blue would be smoother regardless due to the delta hedging. Back in the first video in this series, you may remember that the very first call we sold in the 10th of November expiry was in the money when it was closed with an IV order. The call being in the money wasn't a big deal for us as the price action was one-sided and slow enough that our delta hedge leg made a nice profit, cancelling out the loss made by the short call. This can be seen by the blue line remaining relatively flat during this period. Had we not been delta hedging though, and had we instead just held the short call naked, this would have resulted in quite a large realised loss when the position was closed, as we can see with the red line. We should be careful about drawing too many conclusions from this limited dataset, but in general, 
the profit and loss of the Delta hedge portfolio is smoother than that of the unhedged portfolio, and I would certainly rather have the blue equity curve than the red one. Sometimes the Delta hedging will save the account from a large loss that would have been incurred by shorting naked options. Essentially, when the shorted options get far in the money at expiry. However, in different circumstances, the delta hedging may lead to several smaller losses that would not have been suffered had we simply shorted the options and left them alone. If the price moves around a lot, but eventually settles at a price where all the options are out of the money, then the hedging will simply represent a cost, decreasing the amount of the collected premium that we get to keep. The main focus of this video series so far has been on how to actually execute option trades on Deribit, the dynamic delta hedging of an option portfolio, and the Greeks Live delta hedging tool itself. We will continue with this same account in January, after the ETF decisions have been announced. We will look at some different option structures and strategies, so not just short strangles. We will also look at some different hedging techniques, such as using other options to hedge instead of the futures. I hope you have found the series so far useful, and I'm certainly looking forward to creating much more content in 2024. If you have any suggestions or requests for things you would like to see me cover, just let me know in the comments, or feel free to message me on Twitter. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.